Thank you, Rick. Uh, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me here today to speak to you and for inspiring me to keep the themes of this conference, these conferences, uh, in mind while doing my research. So as Rick said, I want to talk to you about nonlinear interactions of what are called kink unstable flux ropes and uh, shear alpha in waves in plasmas. And in the end, I hope to show you that the, from these large scale, generally large scale structures we can produce, uh, at least one step down in creating smaller scale structures. Not a cascade, but at least a step towards that. And so I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, Professor Walter Geckelman, who's here with us today, uh, Sri Krishna Jatapati, uh, one of our graduate students, Tim De Haas, and Patrick Tribble, uh, and our thanks to our funding agencies, the, um, the uh, uh, National Science Foundation and the offices of uh, Fusion Energy Science at the Department of Energy. So I'll go into a little bit about the motivations uh, for this research. I'll do a quick review on what I think the, some key points are the kink oscillations for the plasma, what a shear alpha N wave is, because I know this is a diverse group. Uh, then the experimental setup. I will show you the frequency three-wave matching conditions for the interaction of these two different oscillations, uh, a K theta three-wave matching condition satisfying, satisfaction. Uh, then the energy transfer from the, from the larger to the smaller scales. So I'll show that quantitatively. Uh, and then we'll do a bispectral analysis to demonstrate that the, the interaction is a quadratic, uh, or at least in part, is a, is a, a quadratic uh, energy transfer between the two scales in, in the summary. So some of the motivations for this are the ubiquity of um, what are called magnetic flux ropes and shear alpha N waves in magnetized plasmas. So you find these structures anywhere from uh, the solar surface out into the solar wind um, and into the, the magnetosphere, the magnetotail of the Earth and of uh, other planets um, which have magnetospheres. So these structures can be very large. You can see an example from the TRACE satellite. Uh, this is a magnetic flux rope, which is a bundle of twisted magnetic field lines in a plasma. I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, which is probably larger than the size of the Earth, which then undergoes a kink oscillation, causing it to twist a little bit. And this may tr be a trigger uh, condition for a, a process called magnetic reconnection, which then allows this process to detach itself from the magnetic fields of the sun and then flow as a, uh, a coronal mass ejection into the solar wind. Uh, let's see. So a very quick review. So imagine you have a, pl a plasma which is carrying a current. It has a length L. Uh, so plasma here is in, in this orange color. The magnetic field uh, produced by the current, and it's all embedded in the background magnetic field. So the magnetic field produces a current which is going, uh, following these arrows, as musically around the magnetic flux tube. The plasma has a radius A, and this length L. Now suppose you would introduce a small uh, perturbation, uh, a displacement for the for the plasma, let's say it doesn't like snakes very much. So this plasma moves out of the way. You've created a small uh, disturbance in the plasma there. So what does that, what does it have, tend to do? It, it creates an increased, a decreased magnetic pressure on one side and an increased magnetic pressure on the other. And you can see that this increase in magnetic pressure then tends to reinforce this, uh, this perturbation. Now the, the actual kink instability has a lot more uh, uh, there's a lot more detail than this, but for this audience, I thought this is just a brief introduction to what it might be. Um, so uh, again, these are the dimensions of the plasma. The uh, criterion for this becoming kink unstable is suppose this perturbation uh, can propagate down to some boundaries. So the lowest mode you can have would be a half a wavelength. And can that perturbation, uh, which exists as in, two, in the cylindrical form in a two-dimensional uh, sense, can it, does it spiral, does the magnetic field cause by this spiral around once by the time it gets all the way down the, the, the cylinder? And uh, this leads to this, what's called the crystal chiffronoff limit, which I'll show you where we satisfy this and where we don't in the experiment later. But that's just the basic idea. Uh, now for alphane waves, what are they? Where, they are, as I said, like uh, they are a ubiquitous phenomenon in, in magnetized plasmas. They are responsible 
Uh, they're very low frequency. They propagate below the ion cyclotron frequency. They're responsible for uh, transferring, uh, propagating changes in magnetic field topology uh, at these low frequencies throughout the, for example, the magnetosphere. Uh, you find them anywhere from tokamak plasmas, lab other laboratory plasmas. Um, in the Earth's magnetosphere, for example, uh, they can they have both perpendicular and parallel electric fields. They can therefore accelerate particles along the background magnetic field. There are certain types of, types of aurora that are generated by the parallel electric fields uh, carried by alphane waves, which are generated in the magnetotrail through this process called magnetic reconnection I mentioned earlier. They accelerate electrons towards both of the poles. Um, they generally have length scales along the background magnetic field, uh, uh, scaled by the ion inertial length, or C over, omega, C over omega pi, where omega pi is the plasma frequency. And across the magnetic field, they can have scales down to uh, either the electron inertial length or the ion gyro radius, or what's called the ion sound gyro radius. Um, but the key takeaways is they have both parallel and perpendicular fields, and they can be, depending on the frequency, also a very long wavelength. Okay. Now, these experiments are performed at the large plasma device, um, which is the main operational device of the basic plasma science facility. There's a uh, URL here. You, I'm encouraging all of you to visit. This is a user facility for basic plasma physics research. It's not just in the US, but uh, participants can come from around the world. Anybody here can propose to do an experiment, uh, even if you're a theorist. Ask our, uh, our chairman. So uh, please, if you have an idea for an experiment, we'd like to work with you to bring that to fruition. Uh, so either come talk to myself or Walter Geckelman, who's up front here. We'll be here all week, and we'll be happy to talk to you about, um, about doing possible experiments. OK. Uh, the device itself is 20 meters long. So in terms of that uh, length scale I mentioned, the ion inertial length, it may be in this case, uh, we're using a uh, proton plasma, so the ion inertial length, uh, the, the size of the machine is about 200 um, ion inertial lengths in length. Uh, across the field, the, the machine can be, can be highly magnetized or going to lower magnetic fields, but it's it always a, it's a magnetized plasma, some 100 to 1,000 uh, ion gyro radii across the, mag, uh, across the, the plasma column or up to six ion inertial lengths across the plasma column. There are two sources in the, in the large plasma device. One is a large sheet of nickel, which is heated and coated with a special material, barium oxide, to reduce the work function. This produces a 60 centimeter diameter plasma for the, entire, for the 20, lengths, 20 meter length of the, of the device. There's a second cathode with a higher emissivity. It allows the creation of a hotter, denser plasma within this ambient background plasma. So we use that in conjunction with a mask, which is just a piece of carbon or graphite with a hole cut out of it, to create, uh, since the, the source itself is actually a square, it's 20, like 20 centimeters, so we use this mask to create a uh, cylindrical, uh, uh, cylindrical plasma, and then have an E anode for this plasma. Um, the anode for the main plasma is about 50 centimeters away. So this is net current free. But for creating the rope, the magnetic flux rope, we put an anode some uh, 13 meters away in this, in this configuration. So we have a long uh, current here where we can vary the, the current in the background magnetic field and vary this, um, this instability threshold. Some of the, um, some of the Plasma parameters are down here, some of the scale plasma parameters. Um, uh, beta, which is the ratio of the kinetic uh, thermal pressure to the background magnetic field pressure um, in this experiment is varied from 0.01 to 0.1. Uh, in the solar wind, uh, this is about one, so we'd like to push this in that direction. Um, magnetic Reynolds numbers are very high, as well as the Lundquist number. Um, and one final f feature of the, the mask, which produces the cylindrical column, is that on the other side of it is a uh, wire structure in devised to produce a slight magnetic perturbation. So the, 
Um, the kink oscillation will occur sometime during the plasma if it is kink unstable. We don't know exactly when it will happen. If you apply a small seed perturbation, just a few, uh, a few gauss out of the hundreds of gauss that might be present in the background magnetic field, you can initialize or basically set the initial phase of the, plasma, of the kink oscillation. And you can use that to perform uh, uh, averaging the data that, that I'll show next. You don't have to do that. You could also use correlation functions, but we find that uh, it can, you, can, you can do either one. Um, well, I will use a variety of, in, uh, two types of antennas that are inserted in the, in the middle of the plasma, and we'll get to those in a little bit. They're basically designed to launch uh, three different polarizations of the wave. And in cylindrical geometry, they'll launch an M equals zero mode of the alphane wave, an M equals minus one mode, or an M equals plus one. So, I'm going to have three different source waves. Uh, and this is a, a movie. Um, it's actually two movies side by side. They're taken, uh, the machine operates in a pulse mode where the plasma is created once per second. So we, and we keep the machine on for three or four months at a time. Um, this experiment went on for about a week and a half. Um, so each shot, uh, the, the plasma is very reproducible from shot to shot. And with the seeding of the kink oscillation, these are actually two different discharges. Uh, ah, here we go. So this is the anode in the back. This is one of the antennas. And you see a whole bunch of probes coming in from one side. This view is from one end of the device. So the, the source for the, uh, the magnetic flux rope is, is, behind, is out of the page here. Uh, and the main plasma source is far off on, into the distance. So you can see the oscillation of the kink mode. And again, this, they are, they're phase locked throughout the experiment. OK. So we can vary, as I said, the, the current that comes out of the cathode and vary the background magnetic field. So this is just, just to establish whether we are launching or, or exciting a uh, kink instability. So if we rewrite that condition I provided earlier we can, and very, use the magnetic field, keeping these other, uh, the, current in the, sh the current constant, the length is constant, and the size of it is constant. If we just vary the background magnetic field, uh, we can see this would be unstable if the magnetic field uh, satisfies this criterion. And for us, this is 500 Gauss. So what we did was vary the background magnetic field from 1,500 Gauss down to 350 Gauss. So these two cases should be unstable to the kink instability. And the rest, green through magenta, should be stable. So what we find, this is the driving frequency of the alphane wave. And this is the spontaneously observed um, so this is done with the this modulation or seeding off. So this is the primary kink frequency, and you can see some harmonics there. And you can see that they occur um, primarily when this primarily grows when we cross this kink uh, stability threshold. So we're exciting this. This is trying to demonstrate that we're exciting this this mode. And you also notice the production uh, of these sidebands around the primary driver frequency. So these daughter waves I'll identify as, uh, and you'll see there are others, but I'm going to focus on the, uh, the lower sideband, which I'll denote with an L, the upper sideband uh, with U. Um, I will call the kink mode, denote that with K, the antenna or alphane wave frequency I will, I'm going to label with an A. So, um, now I'm going to look at the, the mode structure. I'll show you the instantaneous mode patterns of the magnetic field in planes perpendicular to the, magnetic, the background magnetic field. So and I mentioned three types of antennas uh, that we're going to use. Um, the kink mode itself has a natural m equals minus 1 character. So with the driver of, with three different drivers, um, in order to satisfy these frequency matching conditions for the three-wave process, uh, so these fall right on the difference of the kink frequency. So the frequency matching conditions are easy, easily seen from the power spectrum. Um, but these M number matching conditions should also, should also match for all these three combinations. So we have these three drivers, one kink mode, uh, 
and an upper and lower sideband. So in total, we're going to have to have match six different uh, M-mode patterns. Mm -hmm. And here they are. So again, uh, this is data taken at a grid of 35 by 35 uh, spatial locations. So that's 1225 uh, spatial locations. Uh, the, the probe visits this site, accumulates uh, an ensemble average of 20 shots, and then moves to the next uh, location. So this, these data are acquired by the computer overnight. Um, these are, so this is the time series frequency filtered for the, for the kink mode here for the alphine driver frequency. In this case, it's the m equals zero mode. And then it's further frequency filtered at the, uh, the daughter frequencies, the upper and lower sidebands. Um, and then the mode pattern is reconstructed here. So you can see, in this case, with a, the kink mode is fixed, the upper band should have, uh, which is the sum frequency, should have a mode number of 0, minus 1, or minus 1 in total. The lower band should have uh, minus, minus 1, or plus 1. So we should have, for combination of this, plus and minus 1 mode numbers. So you can kind of see there are two current channels that are formed here. That's an m equals 1 structure. If we do a decomposition um, in Fourier space, then we can see that primarily that the the upper mode, which is, sorry, the lower mode, which is in blue, the upper is in red. Um, so the lower band indeed has the plus one mode number. Uh, the driver is, of course, fixed at m equals zero. The, uh, the kink mode is primarily at m equals minus one, or there's some, some other components. And the lower band, the lower, lower mode is at minus one. So it satisfies these m number matching conditions. And for the other two cases, uh, what we expect for now we have, we have the same driver pattern for the kink mode, the alphane uh, driver in the m equals plus one case, then pr should produce an m equals zero and m equals plus two uh, mode pattern. So there's a kind of m equals zero pattern, and m equals, I don't know what here, but that's what this graph is for. This is, tells you that primarily this. Uh, this is the lower band, so the lower band is in blue. It's primarily in the, in the plus two state, although there are other M harmonics. So that's all the six uh, daughter waves that satisfy this uh, as muthal mode number matching condition, if you will. Oh, sorry, I guess I didn't do this one. This is the opposite of the other one, except now the lower band is this. If we go back, uh, sorry. So the upper band, was zero, the bottom was one. If we switch the polarization of the driver, these two flip, and now you get minus two mode and an m equals zero, and indeed the, the mode and matching number. So that, that is the six total uh, as muthal mode, mode and matching conditions that I wanted to show you. Now, what about the transfer of energy from the larger to the, to the lower scales? So what we do is, a, in, again, we're in cylindrical geometry, so we do a Bessel function decomposition of the, of the radial uh, mode patterns. Uh, so for the kink instability and the driver mode, I'm just going to show the m equals zero mode uh, from now on. Um, the m equals zero mode is a very large uh, spatial pattern, so uh, it really hits the limit of the, the k spectrum that we can measure here. Um, but it's close, and I've scaled this to the uh, k-perp times the ion, gy uh, ion gyro radius, um, which is the dissipation scale for the, uh, for the, uh, and the kinetic scales for the ions. So this is ultimately one of the places where the energy can wind up in a cascade. Um, so we're not near k-perp perp equals one. The, both the kink and the alphane wave uh, have, have k-perp rho y close to point 0.1. For both the upper and lower sideband, um, the decomposition yields the caper rho i closer to 0.3 for both of, for both of them. Um, so you can see roughly a doubling or um, a, du a doubling in case space of where the power is for these lower modes, although the, you know, the total amplitude, as you saw from the power spectrum, uh, is not as high as the driver mode. So we're not pumping 
an equal amount there, but we are transferring energy from these larger to lower scales, smaller scales. Okay. Now, is this really a, um, a quadratic interaction between the two? So I'm going to turn to the bispectral analysis to demonstrate that this is actually happening. So for those of you not familiar with the, the bispectrum, uh, it's a third order spectral quantity. Um, the brackets denote an ensemble average over n realizations. I'm going to show you some uh, data where the real number of realizations is about 1,500. Um, uh, each of these is a Fourier transform of the time series, so from uh, from a single probe. So this, and the third unit here. So you have one single time series. You, you compare. You notice this is a function of two different frequencies. It's one frequency you're interested in, a second frequency you're interested in, and a third frequency which matches the three-wave coupling. So. If you then weight this by the power that's in the cross spectrum and the auto spectra for uh, for the third for the uh, third wave, uh, and weight by weight that by the absolute value squared of the bi spectrum, you get the bi coherence. So, if the waves um, which satisfy this three wave condition are in phase at all, you know, for the entire spectrum, um, for for the for the entire ensemble then this value uh, will go to 1. So this, and if they're completely out of phase, then by the time you're done with the ensemble averaging, um, this, will, this will take this uh, to be 0. So this is a value that goes from 0 to 1. And it gives you directly the, num the amount of power uh, that is transferred, the, the amount of power that is in a particular mode, which is due to the other two frequencies. And here's the data. So this is the bicoherence. And I'm only, the bicoherence is normally shown in a, in a very large plane. But because of the wide separation in frequencies uh, and uh, the fast digitization rate, um, you wouldn't be able to see many of these little dots. So I'm just going to show you <laughs> the region of interest of the bi spectrum near the, the alkane driver frequency and the kink frequencies. And it, and its harmonics. So you can see, um, in particular, I'm going to like to focus on just two of these. So this is at the frequency FK and FA. So this is the so this dot indicates the amount of power from the alphane wave to uh, and the kink wave at the upper frequency. So this is. Uh, F alphane plus F kink. So this shows uh, a 40 percent of the power that is in that mode came from a quadratic interaction between the two other modes, the two drivers. Um, the, the value is not as large. This is at a frequency which is uh, down by one kink frequency from the driver mode of the alphane wave, uh, and then up along the vertical axis back to the kink mode. This only has somewhere around 20% uh, or less of the, the power. It seems to have come from a quadratic interaction between the two. But you also notice the, uh, some of these other modes, which are the lower side bends. And I told you in the beginning, I was only going to talk about the, uh, the primary daughter waves. But you saw those other side bands that look like uh, higher uh, order daughter waves. So there seems. Those apparently have um, also you know, a similar energy content or power, which is due to the interaction between um, the daughter and, uh, and those sidebands. And you can also see that it starts interacting with, the, uh, with multiples of the, of the kink wave frequency. And, and if I would show the entire spectrum, you can also see uh, quadratic reinteractions uh, of this with itself, which leads to higher order uh, harmonics of uh, you know, a quadratic interaction of this with itself and a higher quadratic interaction of this with itself. But this is what I wanted to focus on now, just to demonstrate where this energy is coming from. Okay, so I think I'm beyond time. 
So in summary, we've made Kinkle unstable flux rope uh, in the laboratory. Um, in this case, we were able to phase the, or seed the phase of the kink oscillation so that we can uh, do some averaging, but we, that's not a necessary condition for anything that I showed you here. Um, uh, we launched the shear waves with n equals zero and plus one uh, M number uh, as Milton modes and watched the interaction of those with the kink mode. Uh, we observed sidebands of the launch frequency. We identified the in the power spectrum. Uh, they easily satisfied their frequency three-wave matching criterion. Um, the, the, you know, uh, I do say the phase, phase locking allows us to do the measurements. Basically, you can average it rather than doing cross-correlation. So in the sense, it's just the analysis that's a little simpler due to this step. Uh, the azimuthal wave patterns for all six of the daughter waves were in general good agreement between the observed and expected mode numbers. Um, the special function decomposition showed, uh, showed you the m equals zero driver, the transfer of energy from smaller, from this larger scales um, down to the smaller scales. And this is by a factor of two. And the bispectral analysis showed us that this was uh, a quadratic interaction between these the, the kink wave and the L chain wave, uh, and in particular, maybe 20 to 40 percent of the power was directly shown to be due to this nonlinear action between the two waves. And that's all I have for you. Thank you.